Good evening, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. Sound on good? Yep. Okay. I have to agree with Brother Stephen. The music's quite uplifting, and I, I like. I think someone specifically chose that last song about perfect peace and rest to maybe calm my nerves. Um, so that's really good. In fact, uh, Stephen was asking me whether I was nervous in the front room. Uh, yes, I was, but I was kind of focused as well. And um, the nerves are getting easier. The nerves are getting less, which is good. I think because I'm trying to focus on what I'm doing rather than myself. So, trying anyway. So, we're going to continue our series in First Thessalonians, as you probably guessed. Uh, it's New Year, but we're going to continue the series. And we'll start in chapter 4, verse 13. <clears throat> we'll read to 18. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Let's pray for the Lord's help. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we do thank you. We thank you that you are a great God. We thank you that you've given us your word. You've given us the church and your Holy Spirit. And we do ask that you would help us with all the resources you give us, help us to make good use of them. Father, I pray that you'd help me to communicate the word clearly, uh, just to be focused. And, and uh, we do pray that this word would uh, sink into everyone's hearts, including my own. I pray that it would be applied and lived out. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so this, the title of my message is The Sorrow of Ignorance. And uh, we are a third of the way through chapter four. And uh, as those that have been through the, the studies so far, we've been learning about the ministry of Paul and, and his associates. Um, and uh, basically their ministry to the Christians at Thessalonica. As a recap of recent events, Paul has completed a spiritual review and he gave them three specific recommendations. Uh, they were good recommendations for any Christian. One was to increase in love, uh, then to abstain from all fornication, and thirdly, to reflect holiness in their work life. These recommendations were given so that their Christian lifestyle would be pleasing to God and would be honourable also in the eyes of, of um, everybody that's seen them. It was practical advice for them to become more Christ-like, specifically in preparation for Christ's return, and that's the subject of tonight's message. But Paul also knew that sanctification required more than just behaviour modification. It was not just about them changing outward behaviour, you know, like showing charity. The world does that and they don't know Christ. You know, the world goes to work and works hard. A lot of them do a lot harder job than me, uh, working out in the hot sun. Um, and many in the world are, are very moral people by, by um, observation. But Paul was also very concerned about the heart of man and the heart of these Christians. In chapter 3, verse 13, we've seen this before, but he said, To the end he may establish your hearts, unblameable in holiness, before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Then later in chapter 5, verse 23, And the very, very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you see that Paul was not only interested in the material, outward part of man, the behavioural stuff that we see every day, but he was also concerned about the immaterial, the soul and the spirit. While their behaviour was very important, they needed to, and they needed to live more like Christians. Uh, James tells us that. We know that James tells us to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Um, but in verse 12, Paul briefly ends this practical instruction. 
and he begins to address problems in their thinking. And some of you might be thinking yourselves, oh, here we go, he's a counsellor getting pretty interested. Well, I was, I've got to admit. I got pretty interested with, in, um, in Paul's uh, focus here on the thinking of Christians. It's part of my trade, so, you know, you're interested in that. Um, but it's, it's, it's wonderful what he, what he says, um, and, and also a bit confronting. He says that they had a problem in their thinking. He said that that problem was ignorance. He said, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So he said that they, were, they needed to make sure their behavior was in, was in line with it being a Christian, but now he's saying you really need to think more like Christians as well. You need to trust in, in, in what you know, and here's some, some gaps to the knowledge that I didn't get to, to share with you. So tonight this message is going to consider the effects of Christian ignorance and how it can be addressed biblically. My outline is firstly specifying the ignorance, secondly speaking the word to ignorance, and thirdly sharing the comfort. First point, specifying the ignorance. We see this in in, uh, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. As I said, having completed that review, we've we've covered it previously. Remember he did that review of how the church was functioning at Thessalonica? Having done that, he's he's leaving that practical side of, of sanctification and focusing on their knowledge of biblical truth. This is, but this is really just a continuance of Paul's desire to perfect that which was lacking in their faith. And we all have it, if we're honest. We all have things that are lacking in our faith. If you don't, come and see me and, and give me you know, the USB that you've got and I'll put it in my neck and, and have all your knowledge and I'll be, you know, I'll be very enlightened. <laughs> but most people I met, even very experienced, actually probably the most experienced Christians acknowledge their ignorance more than, than, um, than the younger ones. Those that have been in the word and have known the Lord, they, they know how much they've got to learn. So in verse 13, Paul begins to specify these aspects of the ignorance. Firstly, Paul described the subjects of ignorance. The first thing to note is who is he talking about? This should come as no surprise to those that have been in, in uh, hearing these previous messages. But he says, I would not have you to be ignorant brethren. We know that he's writing to Christians because he's, he's used many Christian titles. In chapter 1, he used the church and the elect, the followers of the Lord and Paul. And in chapter 2, he calls them believers. In chapter 3, he calls them saints. And he's also called them his spiritual children and his brethren. And this is because he is addressing them as Christian family. And this warns us all, really, including myself, that we're all prone to ignorance at times. But to point out ignorance in another person is a sensitive thing. It's, it's very sensitive. If I was to come up to you and go, well, I think you're missing something. And probably if you came out and said to me, I'd, at first I'd be like, oh, no, what have I done? What have I said in the pulpit that I'm ignorant of? And now what effects is that going to have on people? Um, I was worried a little bit about this because this, I'm not very familiar with this subject of um, eschatology, which is the next subject I'll study in college. So, so give me some grace. But regardless, just in this first verse, we see that Paul was willing to carefully give constructive feedback to these people that he cared about. And he was willing to say that they were ignorant. He did it in a careful way because if you read the first part of the book, he was, very, he was actually very warm and he said how much he loved them and he cared for them and he desired to be back with them. Uh, so he was very sensitive and he, he, he was encouraging them. But he, he also didn't tiptoe around the fact that they had some big gaps in their knowledge. Uh, secondly, Paul described the scale of this ignorance. Again, in verse 13, Paul refer, refers to them in the plural as brethren. In the second part of the verse, he also uses the plural pronoun ye. Paul is not ad- addressing this part of the letter to a particular Christian, and that's because many were affected by the issue. It seems like something so big that even Timothy couldn't address, he couldn't nip it in the bud when he'd done that field visit in chapter 3, which we read about. So this required pastoral oversight. It was a, a serious concern. 
It may have started with one person, don't know. I can't, can't know that for, for sure from the book. But at this point, all we do know is that it became a church-wide problem. So it spread pretty fast. Paul also describes the substance of the ignorance. So what I mean by that is, what was it about? What was the ignorance? In verse 13, it says, them which are asleep. As the Thessalonians were already believers, their ignorance was not about the existence of God or the redemption that is available to us all through Christ. Rather, they were specifically ignorant about the plan of salvation for Christians who died before Christ's return. It was a specific ignorance. In verse 13, Paul uses the word sleep as a euphemism to describe these Christians who had died. And in verse 14, he identifies them as they which sleep in Jesus. Likewise, in verse 16, they are called, clearly called the dead in Christ. So there's really no doubt who he's talking about here. The other thing to notice is they were not entirely ignorant, but they were only partially so. Prior to the persecution, Paul and Silas did have opportunity to teach them about Christ's return and the rapture of the saints. This is very evident in the first chapter. In chapter 1, verse 3, if you want to flick back there. Verse 3 says that Paul remembered their patience of hope or expectation in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. That word hope, we know, is expectation. It's not a, a wish. It's not a I hope so, hope. But it's I'm expecting this to happen. They're expecting the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, likewise, down in verse 10, Paul wrote that they waited for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So we know these Christians were not completely ignorant as they were expecting Christ to return for the saved. They just needed further information to fill in the gaps. We also need to continue doing that. That's why we come to church. That's why we're here preaching. That's why we have our studies, uh, our personal studies. And if we don't, we will remain partially ignorant of very important facts. That's part of the reason why I'm going to college, obviously to ex explore what the Lord might want to have to me. But um, I, was, I think I was saved about 15 years ago this year, and I've got huge gaps in, in my knowledge. And, but just in the short amount of time that I've been at college, uh, I've learned so many things, so many amazing things that, that God did when I was saved that I was ignorant of. And I think you can probably relate when you're a kid, you just take a lot of things for granted by your parents. You know, they, they wash you, they bathe you, they put up with you, and they teach you things. But then when you're older, and, or if you have kids yourself, or you're, you're an age where you can understand things, you realise that you, your parents actually did a lot for you. Not only were they partially ignorant, they were also unintentionally ignorant, though. And people are sometimes called ignorant as an insult, I've, I've heard that used before, like arrogant and ignorant. Um, but the meaning of ignorance is simply a lack of knowledge or information about something. That's, that's what it's really about. So, and one can be ignorant by choice or it can be unintentional. Uh, I'm intentionally ignorant of the rules of cricket and most land sports. Just, I just don't find them fun. And, and I'm fine with that. I can live with it. However, the Thessalonians were more likely to be unintentionally ignorant. Christ preached about the resurrection of the living and dead. He preached that he was the resurrection. Paul knew these facts. Yet it appears that these Christians had limited knowledge and hope in these facts, probably because the teaching of the Thessalonians ended, or it, cut, it was cut short early. That's recorded in Acts 17. It was cut short very violently. And I imagine Paul and Silas, well, we know that they wanted to continue their teaching because that's why they sent Timothy, and that's why they wrote this letter that we're studying. So, so this really, this passage that we read doesn't imply at all that they're intentionally ignoring the truth about the resurrection. It, it doesn't indicate that, I, I don't believe. They were not like the Sadducees that we know denied the resurrection. And also the context of this letter does not include a stern rebuke from Paul about these facts. I don't believe it does. We could read that by the word of ignorant, but I think that's more because of our cultural uh, understanding of the, the, the use of the word. Uh, he's actually quite warm throughout the letter, I find, and encouraging and desiring to continue to teach them. 
Uh, he's, he's been much more, you can see when he's being harsh. Read Galatians. <laughs> That's when he's being harsh. In this letter, it's quite different, I think. Uh, but he's still concerned. He had a genuine concern that they hadn't learned some key biblical truths. And in fact, in verse 18, as we'll get down there, he wants them to be comforted in the truth rather than in ignorance and feeling hopeless. Now, while they were partially and unintentionally ignorant, they didn't have the completed Bible at their disposal. We've got it. Like, we've got it complete here. It's, it's here. You can get it on the internet. You can get it on your phone. You get a hard copy. There's a stack of them on the, on the table back there. Um, and you can read all about it in all different places about, about these, these truths of the resurrection of the dead and the living and the return of Christ. So we really have less of an excuse for ignorance these days. We've, we, we have. Paul also went on to describe the symptoms of ignorance. First 13 shows that their ignorance is causing them to sorrow. Paul is not speaking against having sorrow for a good reason. I don't believe that. Neither is he being unsympathetic to the bereaved. Uh, I don't, don't want to imply that at all. Uh, I've, I've been bereaved. My mother died five years ago. She's, I believe she's a Christian and in heaven. Um, so this kind of applies to that situation, I feel. That's kind of why I was interested in the study. Um, I don't believe Paul has been unsympathetic at all. How could Paul encourage love in all his epistles and then tell these bereaved Christians just to simply you know, cheer up and get over it? That wasn't the problem. Grieving the death of a loved one is a normal emotion and actually Christians are encouraged to grieve at times. Uh, for example, to empathise with brethren who experience trials, Romans 12.15 says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Matthew 5.4 also says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The shortest verse in the Bible even says that Jesus wept. But like any emotion, it does become problematic. It can become problematic when it is not based on truth and reality, and that was the problem for the Thessalonians. They had hopeless sorrow because they lacked knowledge in a key biblical truth. They were ignorant and thinking like unbelievers. And this happens to the saved also. It can happen to us if we're not in the word of God and we're not reminded of the truth of God. When we don't learn and live the Bible, we forget about his attributes. We forget that he keeps his word. If he says that he's coming back, he'll come back. If he is powerful enough, and he is powerful enough, he will raise up the dead. If he promises salvation, he will, he will keep that promise. Back in verse 5, the Christians were warned against having the lusts and behaviour as the Gentiles, which know not God. Now they're told not to think or sorrow like the unbelievers. It says, even as others which have no hope. We've been doing the study of Revelation with Pastor Crocker, and uh, I like this verse. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. If you're a Christian, you're like, we look forward to that day. It's going to be amazing. But while we are redeemed from sin and death, we still live in a broken world that is affected by sin. For now, we will experience sorrow throughout our earthly life. I know it's, it's a, probably a pretty somber thought to talk about death and things at the start of the year, but uh, the reality is people are going to die this year. Um, and and we, we experience death, so it's good to know what the Bible says about it, understand the truth. And what if some of our sorrow, the so sorrow that we experience, is, is worsened by misunderstanding Bible truth? I know there's sometimes a fear of um, people saying, you know, if, you, if you're not having enough faith, and you're not a strong enough Christian, uh, then that's why you're, you're suffering in different ways. But that's not the case at all. It's, it's, um, but I think it can be worsened. I think it can be worsened, definitely. If you have any physical ailment or mental ailment, I think it can be definitely worsened by your lack of understanding of clear scripture. I find a lot of comfort. I've struggled physically, emotionally. I treat many people with, with similar concerns in the hospital. But um, I get a lot of comfort knowing the scriptures and what it says about it, about those things. 
this was the case for the Thessalonian Christians. They, they had spiritual ignorance. To counteract this, Paul first specified the nature of their ignorance. He specified that the subjects were Christians, that the scale was church-wide, uh, that it was about the hopelessness that they had for the deceased Christians, and that they were experiencing hopelessness for this, um, sorrow for this. And we can be ignorant too. We may not have the ignorance of this particular topic because we have it in Scripture, or we could if we don't read about it. Our ignorance may be different. It might be a specific type of ignorance and it may cause us distress in one way or another. And Paul goes on to give us his remedy or what he does about it. My second point is speaking the word. Verse 15 says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Paul used the word of God to address their ignorance. And in order to lead them to the Lord, he, he did this in the first place. He, he reasoned from the scriptures, the written word of God. Acts 17, 2 says, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. He did it for their salvation, and now he's doing it for their sanctification. He's, he's opening the word of God to them. We can do this ourselves. As I said, we have the scriptures in doing so, Paul describes the process of Christ's coming and the resurrection of believers. In verse 14, we understand that Jesus died and rose again. We read this earlier. In verse 14 says, Jesus died and rose again. The body of Christ died and rose again. He didn't die. He was always, his body died, but he was always God and, and he's eternal. So uh, it was his humanity. This guaranteed that Christ is, is God and has power over death and the resurrection of man. He is able to, to resurrect man, whether they're living or dead. Secondly, it says that them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. The body of a dead Christian remains buried while their soul and spirit are with God in heaven. Thirdly, we read in 15, we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So those that are still alive at his coming will be caught up in the clouds after the bodily resurrection of the dead Christians. And the last process is, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. At the rapture of the church, all Christians will meet together with Christ in the clouds. And we'll remain with him forever. Or we'll be with, with, with those loved ones that we have that are saved, which will be a great day. From this portion of the scripture, we see the deliverance of all Christians who are dead or alive at Christ's coming. And this would have brought a very specific hope for them. It would have brought a lot of comfort to those that were worried about this. Can you imagine not knowing the plan of salvation for, for our loved ones that, that are Christians and have died? And we didn't know that. We've got it in the scripture here, but imagine you didn't know that. You'd be, you'd be concerned. I know, I know I would. But now they, they could expect to see their deceased Christian family and friends in heaven. This knowledge of the truth was powerful and it was comforting. So when we're struggling with extreme sorrow, we should first go to the scripture to seek God's grace and peace. 2 Peter 1, 2 says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God, and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us, us to glory and virtue. We get the knowledge through the word of God, and the Holy Spirit helps us to understand that. After Paul shared the word of God, he tells them how to put this biblical truth in action. It wasn't just meant to be for them, and uh, it, was, it was meant to be shared. Point three, sharing scriptural comfort with others. This morning, Stephen reminded us of the comforter we have in the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 says, But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your resemblance whatsoever I have said unto you. In addition to the Holy Spirit, God has given Christians another major source of sanctification and comfort, and this is his word. Verse 18 says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. 
the Holy Spirit teaches us and comforts us by using the Word of God and applying it to our hearts. Remember we said that earlier that Paul identified that the problem was church-wide. This ignorance had affected many people. And so to correct that ignorance, Paul actually encourages them to comfort one another. He's actually saying he knew he was at a distance and he had to go, look, I need you guys to encourage each other, remind each other of the truth. Comfort one another in the truth of God's word. Second Corinthians one thirty three to four. Sorry, Second Corinthians one three to four says that we should encourage each other. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. I love that it says which are in any trouble, which is pretty good. That's, that's pretty applicable universally. So it's good. It's great. So this morning I did a brief church survey of some comfortable verses, some comforting verses. I, I asked a couple of people and they didn't mind me sharing them because uh, I know some. I can think of some that have brought me so much comfort through, through uh, you know, just, just things when I have needed Trump, uh, comfort. So Chris Kish shared this one, Isaiah 26, 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. This perfect peace is what we need when we're sorrowful. And, it, and it's God, we need his perfect peace. Cherith shared Psalm 121, verse 1 to 2. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. That's good. I didn't know these ones, so I'm, I'm learning something new. Um, and Alison, I like this one too. Psalm 91, verse 1 to 2. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Last one is uh, Darren Finlay. I'm not sure if he was here tonight, but he was here this morning. It says, in Colossians 3.2, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Being mindful of the things that are in heaven. Being, being mindful of the eternal things, the things that, that are true but are invisible at this time. God is true and everything about God uh, and everything that he tells us is true. We need to be, have those things in the, in the front of our mind. Does anyone else have a favourite verse? A favourite verse that... I was thinking of Romans 8.28. That's one that's that's uh, been shared, and I imagine a few of you would share that one. Any others that I haven't got? Yes, Eva. Psalm 16, verse 11. Psalm 16, verse 11. I don't know that one. Um, do you know it off the word for word? I got it just here. Okay. Psalm 16. Thou wilt show me the path of life, in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. We need the path of life when we're in sorrow, when we're in dark places, when we're struggling, and we don't know where we're going. It's a great verse. As a counsellor, I'm astounded by the relevance of Scripture for human suffering and sorrow. I'm not saying just to ram a verse down someone's throat. <laughs> that's, that's not... Bible, like that's just, it's just not right. But I'm saying that the Bible is so applicable to ev like everything. Like I haven't found anything it's not. Like you can find, like before that other verse, the universal application of, of comfort. Um, God is is there. He he knows. He sees everything, and he is he's powerful enough. He's wise enough to give us guidance for it. Um, so I continue to to be amazed by the wisdom in Scripture. And as we begin a new year, I think we should all just be encouraged to continue doing what we're doing, coming and learning from the Word of God, learning how it applies to our life and even the hard times. So in this message, we've looked at the problem of Christian ignorance and that it can occur to, for Christians. It's, I know that the unsaved are ignorant. They're ignorant of God. They're ignorant of His Son. But we can be ignorant too. Or we can be ignorant of, of things that give us victory in this life. To, to address this, we need the written word of God. We need to know what is the specific ignorance and to go to the word of God 
to find out what the Word of God says about it. And then, more likely than not, other people are going through the similar thing. That's what was happening at Thessalonica. And that's what happens today. Many people think that they're the only one going through it, but I can tell you, many others do, because I speak to them at times. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the scripture is applicable, and I look forward to learning more from it this year. Let's end in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are such a wonderful God. I know you don't expect us to know everything, otherwise we would be God. We can't, but we, we do desire to know you more, Father. And I do pray that you would help, the, help us to just be keen to get in the Word this year. Help us to prioritize reading your Word, Father. Help us to uh, just knock out any barriers that might obstruct us coming to you and your Word. And we do pray that you might just open it to us. Help us to, to be changed by it and uh, to be excited to learn, learn the truths that are in it, Father. We thank you that you've given us your word, that we have it in our language, that you've preserved it all these years. And Father, we thank you for, for your, um, your gift of salvation that comes from knowledge of it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.